if you are not using AI to write the majority of your code in 2026, you are risking seriously falling behind as a developer, is something I would say if I wanted to FOMO you into watching this video. However, I will share my practical .NET developer roadmap for 2026, where I won't be focusing on any given library that you should master, because these are mostly implementation details, instead we're going to focus on the fundamentals. I'm going to break this down into a couple of high-level topics that I think you should have mastery of to be a proficient .NET developer in 2026. Now I'm calling this the 2026.NET Roadmap Fundamentals Edition because I don't want to focus on libraries. These come and go pretty often. Some of them that are popular today go commercial tomorrow and people just stop using them and move on to the next thing. So that's why we have to focus on the things that don't change. And number one, this is going to be .NET and C Sharp. So in this section, I'm going to say you want to strive to be on .NET 10 or at the very least .NET 8 or 9, as these are the latest versions, .NET 10 being the long-term support release. They have the most performance improvements, they also have the latest developments and APIs in the various libraries that you would be using. So that's what I would be focusing on if I was looking to upskill myself as a .NET developer. Now when it comes to frameworks, we have ASP.NET Core. This is still your bread and butter for the majority of .NET applications out there. And I'm going to say that you probably want to focus more on minimal APIs, but you should also know controllers. As these are going to be transferable between the many popular frameworks if you want to, for some reason, branch out of .NET. Another key concept is DI or dependency injection. You should understand how this works, both from an implementation perspective between the various lifetime scopes that we have in ASP.NET Core, as well as a design concept for building your applications and what benefits you get with dependency injection. Then you should master auth and security. We have a few options for this in .NET and you should be spending some time learning how you can implement this. And then lastly, I'm going to flag testing with a focus on integration testing, preferably using something like test containers as this allows you to mimic your complete development environment to have maximum confidence in your tests. If you master these things, you're probably 90% of the way there of the things you will need to be proficient as a .NET dev. The next thing you're going to need is some sort of database. And I'm going to give you two choices here. You choose whatever works best for you. It's either going to be Postgres or SQL Server. I know some of you are expecting something exotic like a NoSQL database, but what I'm focusing on is something more fundamental than the specific flavor of SQL that I have here, and that is the underlying concept. That is SQL or relational databases. If you understand SQL and how it works, you'll be able to apply these skills in any kind of database. My personal choice is Postgres because number one, it's awesome. Number two, it's free to use and it's supported in most cloud providers. And you can build pretty much any type of application that you can think of using Postgres, but more on that in a moment. I wanted to highlight SQL because there are a couple of concepts here that you should understand. So these are going to be data modeling, and how to structure your database schema, then indexing to be able to improve the performance of your application queries. And this one might be a bit on the advanced side, but it's understanding query plans using something like explain, analyze in Postgres. Now I actually did a video about this quite recently. I'm going to link the video in the description and it's also going to pop up in the corner of this video as you're watching. Understanding all of these things will help you use your SQL databases to their maximum potential. Now, let me explain why I favor Postgres. Postgres isn't just a relational database. It's actually an object relational database. And this means that you can do some interesting things with it other than just storing rows and tables. So fundamentally, it is a relational database, but it also has very extensive support for JSON. And there are libraries out there that will allow you to treat Postgres as a makeshift document database. Now, it also has a rich set of extensions in the ecosystem, for example, something like PG Vector. And suddenly you can turn your relational database into a vector database and start implementing some advanced features like semantic search. It also comes with a bunch of other extensions like pgcron that lets you do background jobs inside of your database. You can even efficiently store time series with something like timescale db. And there's lots of samples out there that covers how to implement all of this. As I said, you can run Postgres in any major cloud provider. So whatever you choose is probably going to work. Then number three, I'm going to say you need mastery of messaging. 
to some extent at least, because most modern applications are going to grow out of a single server and a database and start needing to do some more asynchronous work. And this is where messaging can come in. Now you could definitely use Postgres to also cover this part, but I'd probably recommend using something more standard here. And I'm going to give you a couple of suggestions. My default choice if self-hosting my message broker is RabbitMQ, but I also recommend exploring Azure Service Bus, or if you're using AWS, you have SQS and SNS to be able to implement the majority of the messaging patterns that you might need. Now, again, we have an underlying concept that we should understand when it comes to messaging. And these are the various broker topologies between queues and topics. Queues allow you to send a message on one end and consume it on the other, and only one consumer can pick up the message. Topics allow you to implement broadcasting and a couple of more other patterns. Then you need to understand how item potency works. And this is very important when it comes to messaging because you have to think about things like delivery semantics with the default one being at least once, which means you may get a message delivered once or more times. And this is where deduplication on the publisher side and item potency on the consumer side come in. And I covered both of these topics in a recent video where I was talking about the item potent consumer pattern. If you're looking for something more advanced, you can explore the outbox and inbox pattern. But nonetheless, this is going to be a fundamental topic that you need to master regardless of which library you are using to facilitate actually sending messages from your .NET code. So with these three things, you can probably build like 90% of the applications out there. And if you need anything extra, you can just figure it out on the go. Now, when it comes to the cloud, this is definitely important. And here I'm going to keep it very simple. I'll give you two options, either choose Azure or AWS. You can just pick one, any one of them works just fine. If you don't know how, find a getting started guide out there and figure out how to build a simple application and get it deployed to the cloud. So that's the next thing when it comes to the cloud. Learn to deploy your .NET applications and preferably you want to figure out how to do this using some sort of continuous integration system. The simplest one probably being GitHub Actions. You can build most of the patterns you need using it. So I think this is a good option to get started, but really whichever cloud provider you use, just figure out how to deploy your application. This is going to help you stand out from the crowd so, so much. You may not even be aware of it. And then number five, the hot topic which is AI. And I'm going to actually scope this to AI tooling, which I think you should definitely be using if you care about your time and you want to be an efficient developer in 2026. Now, when it comes to the specific tool that you are using, it doesn't really matter. Just pick one you like. Let's say for IDEs, I use Cursor. And if I wanted to do CLI, you can use something like Cloud Code. I think these are the most popular options with my preference probably leaning towards Cursor and using an IDE. And if you think that AI only generates slop code is probably a skill issue and you don't know how to properly use it. To give you a quick example of using AI, here's how you can use Cursor to implement something that touches most of your application, like let's say taking all of the query handlers which are using EF Core here. And let's say we want to convert this into raw SQL queries to make it more low level and faster. So what you could do is open up each query handler and rewrite the queries yourself, or you can tell Cursor, and this is important, to plan out this migration. So I'm going to use the plan mode to kick this off. And this is going to scan my code base and produce a markdown document outlining the steps that are required to build this feature. It may also ask some clarifying questions such as how to obtain the database access. I'll say that it should create a new abstraction. I don't want to migrate my commands, only the queries, and I'll press continue. And then it's going to produce this document which you can treat as documentation and store it in your repository and is going to outline how it wants to implement this feature. And this is where you come in. You can add more input and steer it in the direction that you want to. And then when you're happy with everything, you can allow it to implement this feature, analyze the code base, and then it becomes very valuable if you have an extensive test suite, you can run your tests, make sure that everything works the same as before. And from there, you can go ahead and make a pull request and continue iterating on this feature if required. So instead of just treating AI tooling as your Vibe coding buddy, actually try to approach this from an engineering perspective, come up with a requirements document that you can hand off to your AI agent to build out the feature that you want. Most of them also support various rule files where 
where you can define your code styles and any preferences that you want to enforce and a lot of these things can be automated now when it comes to my personal preferences for each of these sections it's probably going to be postgres over sql server rabbit mq if i am self-hosting even though i very much enjoy aws i will still choose azure for hosting a dotnet app and then i already mentioned this i like using cursor for my ai development but you could also use many other things for example vs code copilot or even visual studio copilot or i don't know if JetBrains writer also has built-in ai tooling it probably does i just don't know what it's called and then here's a bonus section if you really want to stand out so let me name this as bonus and here i'm going to list out a couple of things if you want to go beyond just being a dotnet dev and into full stack developer territory. And I have to say that with AI tooling, there's really no reason for you not to be a full stack dev. I'm not a fan of the .NET UI frameworks, so I recommend using either Angular or React. I used to be more of an Angular fan. That's all I knew back in the day. Then I learned React. And basically all of these are just component-based single page applications that once you figure out how to use one framework, you can use any one of them proficiently. And then when it comes to the language, I favor TypeScript over javascript although you can definitely start with just javascript and then figure out how to use this in typescript so that's my fundamentals roadmap i know it's not exactly a step-by-step -step instruction for how to become a better dotnet developer in 2026 but honestly you should just pick somewhere where you don't have as proficient skills find a side project or application that you can build and then just go out there and find some time to build this application preferably it's going to be a full stack application with a ui and the back end you definitely want a database you can consider adding a cache in there although it's not required as much messaging can also be optional but i highly recommend learning how to get this deployed and how to automate these deployments using a ci tool like github actions and then you definitely want to learn how to be proficient with ai tooling to make your development faster this is also my first attempt at making some sort of roadmap so depending on the feedback i may do a more in-depth video in the future and i'll probably go back to this in a year from now to see if and how my recommendations might change. If you want to grab this fundamentals roadmap, it's going to be available from the pinned comment right under this video. And if you're looking for what to watch next to improve your skills in 2026, then I recommend checking out this video. Consider smashing the like button if you enjoyed this. Thanks a lot for watching and until next time, stay awesome.